an EMP is, it can be the end goal of a, an explosive device, right? You can create an EMP. You can't create it like in a movie where it's like a little electrical battery that just sends out a pulse. It, it has to be something of a larger, a most explosive character trait. EMPs are also the natural byproduct in a nuclear detonation. Most people, when they think of a nuclear bomb, they think of a nuclear bomb that comes and is delivered by a rocket, hits the earth, and then explodes, creates a mushroom cloud and a fireball, right? What they don't realize is that a nuclear warhead can be detonated at any altitude. It can be detonated one foot off the ground, a thousand feet off the ground, 10 miles off the ground. It can be detonated at any altitude. And that the first wave of energy that comes off of a nuclear explosion is an electromagnetic pulse. So when we studied nuclear weapons in the Air Force, when we went to war college about how to apply and deploy them in combat, the first way that we would use a nuclear weapon is as an EMP. So you would send it, you'd launch it, the whole world would see it coming, right? But then you would actually detonate at altitude. And you would detonate at altitude so that it would send a very large, widespread, conical EMP that would short the fuses and communication devices of everything within its reach, right? So two miles off the ground, you might be able to neutralize 15 square miles of, of landmass, right? Four miles off the ground, you could neutralize 50 miles of landmass. So are these accurate numbers? They're rough, rough okay. numbers. There's an exponential benefit to how far you can neutralize based on the altitude above ground, right? Because what's the what's the widest area that a EMP, a capability that you know of? Mm. How much how much land mass are we talking? It here? would all depend on the yield of the warhead. So I don't remember I don't remember how big our largest warheads are. That number might be classified still for all I know. But if you were to detonate a a large warhead at a high altitude, you would have a huge EMP. You also have to keep in mind that the intensity of the EMP is also related, correlated to how far the devices are from the explosion. Mm -hmm. So something with shielding might survive the EMP. Something with uh, no shielding might not survive an EMP blast that's done in the atmosphere. You know what I mean? So, so that's what we have to think about. When you talk about EMPs, the, the main thing we have to consider is that there has to be some kind of blast to neutralize everything, unless you're talking about a focused energy weapon, which could also do the same thing, short, um, short something out, right? Uh, and it, we would absolutely expect in a large scale conflict, a modern day conflict, you would expect to see cyber warfare to help jam signals, followed by some kind of EMP blast to, to destroy the software and to destroy the hardware that would carry the software assuming they could ever fix the cyber the cyber attack. And then you'd basically have neutralized command communications and relay capabilities. And then you would move in with your attacking force. I mean, it's all energy. All directed energy. No vehicles. No, no, no anything. Not needed, yeah. A vehicle could potentially deliver a weapon. So this is another thing to keep in mind, too. Um, it would take, it could, you could use a low-yield nuclear weapon no mushroom cloud, no way to even identify that it was a nuclear weapon. You could potentially drive it in a truck mm -hmm. and no kidding, just like pop it up from the back bed of the truck. It goes up 500 feet, you know, half a mile, explodes, neutralizes the entire area. I guess what I meant is if we got hit with an EMP, there would be no vehicles, oh. no electric, no communications, no radio. No, no, nothing. Not if it's modern. You're exactly right. Because an EMP would short the circuitry. So anything that's got a smart chip, modern day cars, cell phones, all that stuff would be neutralized. Your old school Chevelle should still be good to go, mm -hmm. but your Tesla would not go anywhere. It'd be a brick, right? Yeah. If we were to be hit by an EMP, that's essentially how it would work. And the, the, again, the more likely way that we would see anything like this happen is we would first see a cyber attack that would neutralize our ability to identify the incoming weapon that would discharge the EMP. So we would see some kind of mass attack that distracts us and blinds us to the incoming attack that launches the EMP and destroys everything. Do you think that this is a realistic scenario? 
Not for us, not for the United States. Why so? Because for someone to, first of all, the United States is so large, it would be very difficult to successfully coordinate an attack against the United States that does both of those things, right? And we've got lots of shielding on our most sensitive equipment. So if someone were to try it, I mean, think of the cities you'd have to cover at one time. Miami, New York, Chicago, uh, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Houston, Dallas, uh, Nashville. Like, you'd have to cover tons of cities with a coordinated cyber attack and coordinated EMPs to neutralize the United States in the hopes that the shielding that's on military bases would be penetrated by the EMP. It's really unlikely, right? Because if you made one mistake, we'd have command and control centralized and we'd be able to respond with the forces that we have through, through backup lines. Your telephone lines wouldn't go down, right? Because they're not reliant on, on conducting chips. They're reliant on fiber optic cables and, and sometimes just old school ethernet cables, right? Like there'd be a lot of infrastructure still in place in the United States, but that's exactly the kind of attack that I would expect to see in an assault on Taiwan. That's exactly the kind of attack that I would expect to see the next time Russia tries to take one of their uh, former satellite states. I mean, it, it, maybe it wouldn't affect the military bases, but it definitely would affect the civilian population. For sure. And with no electricity, there's no food, there's no water, there's no heat. Right, there's, there's no There's no cooling, you know, and, and so... I think that alone, I mean, what, what are they, it's, it's estimated what, three, you have three days if something like that were to happen before, before everything comes unglued and it becomes every man for himself. So yeah. really they wouldn't have to, they wouldn't have to take the military out because the civilian population would just basically eat itself alive. There's the, the X factor that we're not considering is what happens when there's an attack. Ukraine is a fantastic real world example of this right now. President Zelensky's approval rating on February 21st, 2022 was 30%, 30%. President Zelensky's approval rating on February 22nd, 2023 was 90%. Now, why am I saying that? Did the guy suddenly become an amazing president in one year? He's the same guy right? That 90% approval rating came from a mix of gung-ho, hyper-nationalistic Ukrainians who are still in the country, because remember, they've had tens of millions of refugees leave the country. Plus, only a fraction of those gung-ho people can even get to a computer to take a survey. So it's a small sample size of a limited population that all answer 90 to 90% approval rating, right? But the, the thing that that demonstrates is that when there's a common aggressor, everything changes. All, you and I are sitting here talking about the, the potential negative impact of woke culture. As soon as somebody pulls a gun on any of us, on you, me, or some person who self-identifies as they or them, we've got a common enemy. All of a sudden, we don't care about their pronouns. We care about the enemy. So if somebody were to attack the United States, we wouldn't eat ourselves from within. We'd sit there, we'd probably lock arms, pick up weapons, and fight the enemy. That's what we did after 9-11. I know you remember what 9-11 was like. I definitely remember that. I, that was a different time. We it was a different as, time. We weren't near as divided as we are today. It, we weren't, but or, some, of the, some or, of the most contentious uh, activity we saw was coming from the, Boer, the, the Gore and Bush elections just prior to that. Yeah. I don't know. I want to believe you. I really do. <laughs> but I just, <laughs> I just don't see, I don't see Americans locking arms. I just don't see it today. We need a common enemy. Yeah. It, it, what scares me, to be very honest with you, what scares me is the fact that the administration also knows we need a common enemy. Yeah. 